so the, the, the core idea that we extracted, I think, that touches on our work and, and Rachel's work, is this self, the notion of the individual and its boundaries, and the human tendency to exceed the boundary, uh, to devour the world in which we live. This is a very dark panel. Uh, when we talk about curiosity, we don't mean it in that horrible saccharine sense in which it's talked about at schools, but the, the human desire to know in order to envelop, consume, and destroy. So let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so actually, so Rachel, um, just a little bit, you're so biologically fascinated in your work. I mean, it's all animals there and the children's room surrounded by these extraordinary eerie dolls. And as we become adult, that world disappears and we surround ourselves with people just like ourselves. And what, what is that interest in the diverse world of the non-human? That's a big question. Um, <clears throat> well, maybe I'll speak specifically about the work you're referencing the last day for a second. Um, that's a work that I shot in my children's bedroom. Uh, it takes place over seven days, or it represents seven days as seven epics in the world's history, in the primordial, the prehistoric, the modern, industrial, and then into the future. And when I made the work, it, it really came out of actually uh, my daughter, who's now four, about a year ago, contending with the concept of mortality, something that kind of emerges around that age. What is death? What is life? And she made up this story for me about the last day. And she would repeat it to me that the last day was a day where a bunny rabbit would have a birthday party with a truck and uh, I don't know, Mickey Mouse would be there and just essentially detritus from her room would be coming together to represent, in a sense, her concept of mortality. Um, and what I was struck by when she told me this story was that a child's bedroom and children in general absorb a kind of history of our landscape, a history of our relationship to animals and socializing ourselves in relationship to their socialization um, through the toys in their room. Like why are children attracted to dinosaurs and bunny rabbits, um, but also to construction trucks? Uh, they are maybe uh, inherently expressing um, a history that is inside of us as we know biologically in part already. Um, and so I think my work often finds its clues to um, questions I have about the limits or expansions of our bodies in relationship to animals and the landscapes they live within. So um, actually then, Elvia, because yesterday we were chatting and Elvia said that what she would like to be able to do is compost humans. I think that's the phrase you use. Uh, in favor of a world of animals. Is, is that an exaggeration of your perspective? No, not at all. I've never said it like that. <laughs> um, I'm interested, some things that I've written about recently, and Rachel and I are often in conversation, and um, one thing that I've been thinking about is reproduction of life beyond the human family, or beyond the way that we think of human generations, um, because I think my concept of generations has changed um, with an increasing awareness of extinction, planetary change planetary scale change, we could say. Thinking, thinking about the future becomes harder. Um, thinking about, um, you know, my own genealogy suddenly has, takes on a new weight. Um, and so in thinking about, you know, next generations of humans, I'm also thinking about the ways that we can make um, a fertile ground or a different kind of ecological system where non-humans could proliferate. But I always say, you know, non-humans on the organic side, but also non-humans on the machinic side. There's a, we, we could talk about a lot of things if we're using the word non-human. So um, I also want to give space to the in other intelligences um, that we've actually created, because those will certainly be part of our ecologies, if you'd like to call it that. So when I say compost, I mean something that could grow from our ruins, um, whatever those ruins may be. Hopefully humans as well. Great. 
did Rach, are you looking at me? You wanted to make a comment? No, no, no. Anyway, by the way, anything, anyone can, I don't have to be the one asking questions. I'm happy to, but anyone should. By the way, um, that peculiar looking postage stamp um, behind Jeffrey is Ted, Ted Chang. So, because he couldn't get here because his flights didn't work. And so he's flying to Japan on Mondays, so that was tricky. But just so you know what that is, that's not an artwork, that's Ted. <laughs> And then, and so all of these, everyone should have introduced themselves. I'm not introducing anybody. But, but actually, Chris, on that topic, so life at its very origin, so you work on that. And maybe reflect on this point, not just humans and animals, but the origin. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, I think we often think of ourselves as so, um, you know, powerful as a species. We have all these capabilities. We're having these huge effects on the planet. Um, and yet, I think to what you were saying, uh, we're, we're quite fragile in most of most of the ways. We have this huge interdependency on everything else. So, you know, I can't directly photosynthesize sunlight. I require other things to do that, and then, and then we eat them. <laughs> and uh, I require this huge microbiome inside of me, and I require a whole society to exist. And I think that idea goes all the way back to the origin of life. Because at, at the very origin, we're already starting to talk about networks of things and there's a big discussion in origins of life about whether it's really the the origin of an entity or more the origin of a kind of planetary scale process of networks of things and ecologies that emerge and start to shift an entire planet and then out of that maybe you get these different partitions of little entities but um it's it's always i think sort of this this kind of networked um ecosystem perspective about what life is and i think that goes all the way through from um, origin of life all the way up to, um, you know, things like us in, in human societies. Yeah, maybe let's move along because to Manfred, because um, one of the frameworks that's become quite popular in the last 20 years in our world has been this idea of the major transitions in the evolution of life. I did, just comment on, on that a little bit. Yeah, <clears throat> so you know, what Chris and everybody else was saying, so what we are dealing with is a 3.8 to 4 billion year history of life on this planet. And it went along nicely, and sometimes something really interesting happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, we call that a major transition in evolution. And so the origin of life, the origin of cellular life, multicellular organism, uh, all the way to the emergence of us humans uh, and language and culture and everything that comes with it. And those are the major transitions. And they have something interesting because they open up new spaces, new possibilities. And within those new possibilities, also new dangers. So, you know, once you are a multicellular organism, um, one of the things that can happen to you is cancer. Because cancer basically is that individual cells who are supposed to behave within the body decide to do what they evolutionarily should and divide, and that's called cancer. So that's a consequence of a major transition. And now what we have created, particularly over the last 10,000 years uh, at an ever accelerating pace, is a completely new form of life, and we call that the technosphere. And that means that we are no longer just biological entities. We are technological entities. We created a whole sphere that encompasses the whole planet, interacts with all the other spheres through exchanges of energy and materials, and those exchanges are somewhat out of balance, and that's what we experience here, such as the uh, heat waves and everything else connected to global transformations. So I'm actually struck by the uh, symbolism of the number seven, also in, um, in Rachel's work here because we're currently in the sixth mass extinction on the history of the planet. So the question is, what's that seventh period look like that we are entering right now, and whether we will be part of it? And I think, you know, since Jeffrey claims that he is talking all about death, I punt over to him to continue that conversation. Well, actually, bef actually I think, yes, or Ted, right? So, no, because you, you need to look behind you there. And uh, So, actually, um, Ted, since you wrote such a haunting and beautiful story, um, The Life of Software Objects, which is life, a different kind of life, right? Um, artificial life. Do you want to comment on that in relation to this conversation? Um, well, I guess uh, I, was, I was thinking I would uh, talk about the theme of uh, 
uh, magic versus in industrialization. I'll come back to that. Okay. Okay. Um, but okay. So with regard to um, uh, the, the the story I wrote uh, called "The Life Cycle of Software Objects," which is about uh, humans raising uh, conscious uh, software beings. Um, I'd say, you know, one of the things that, uh, one of the things I was trying to explore in that story is, um, what sort of obligations do we have to life forms that we create? Uh, do we have, and especially like if they, if we're creating artificial life forms, which are anywhere close to a uh, human level in their degree of intelligence or the quality of their consciousness. Uh, you know, we have, you know, we, have, to some extent, you know, we have created, you know, some life forms in the form, uh, in the form of, I'd say, uh, domesticated dogs. Uh, domesticated dogs are, uh, in, in a lot of ways, almost entirely artificial. Uh, the way they look, the way they act, the things they want, those are all things that, you know, we sort of specified and, uh, you know, those were not pre-existing things. And, you know, you, know, uh, you know, what kind of obligations do we have to the things that we have made? Um, and there is also uh, the issue of... Um, it, to some extent, you know, the parent-child relationship, uh, which is, you know, a very sort of specific form of uh, creating another form. But uh, there, you know, the, um, you know, the, I, I find that relationship really interesting because of uh, just like how, a, how um, uh, the you know, what uh, the parents' role, what the parents' obligations are, are radically different than, say, the child's uh, obligations. Uh, and uh, that is, you know, really unlike the relationships that uh, adults have with each other. Um, and that, you know, that was something else that, you know, um, yeah, that's another topic that I find, you know, sort of consistently fascinating. Wait, yeah, you're breaking up just a just so folks, I don't know if there's anything to do about that, but you were breaking up a little, Ted, but, but I got it, that, that question. I don't, Manfred wanted to quickly reply to Ted, and maybe I'll come to Jeffrey. Yes, because I think the situation between us and dogs, the way uh, Ted described it, that's what we always tell us, the story, that we domesticated and created the dogs. But in light of, for instance, what Olivia is writing and what Rachel's work is actually about, we have to rethink this. Is it actually we that created the dogs or did the dogs domesticate us? Because if you think about it that way, there are one billion dogs, which would never happen if those would be wolves. Uh, and they have basically controlling eight billion people to create an existence for them. But the reason why I'm bringing this up that way is because what we are learning is that we can't think about our relationship to nature in that unidirectional way. It's a much more complex system of mutual co-evolutionary dynamics. And I think the dog example is a wonderful one in that connection. Let me, and just riffing on this, just again for Rachel perhaps, um, which is our recently member in the last few years, people were defacing artworks in galleries because we weren't paying enough attention to climate issues. And it was an interesting litmus test, I think, of our individual dispositions. I mean, what's more important? And right. And what's your take on that? So, so there's life as we know it. There's the software world that Ted has written about. What about artworks? What's your feeling about the immortality of an artwork? Or sh is it as precious as a life? to think about it. I'm going to just take a second to think. Um, just a question for you. The immortality of the artwork has nothing to do with the climate change activism because that was really centered on just press, basically, and a method for getting press. So I don't know if that has any... There's, there's not a connection there, right? Or, well, only because, I mean, the, the connection is that 
yes, it was to draw attention. What do we truly value? So huge sums of money were going into art, as perhaps they should. Um, but something out in the world was being neglected. And I think they were defacing works that we imbue with huge symbolic value in order to draw attention to things that I think we tend to neglect. I, I do believe that was the motive. So are you asking why do we... No, I'm wondering what you think as an artist. Would you, how do you feel about your work? Are they your children or are they... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I see. Um, okay, I can answer that question. For me, when I make a work, it always starts with a very basic feeling, very just mundane, a thing that I notice I'm thinking about or uh, like a little anxiety or I go to a concert and it's ecstatic or just like a little thing. And I, and I try to take that little thing and... Uh, essentially find a container to attach it to things outside of me and my experience of that little feeling or that little impression. Um, and so for me, making an artwork is essentially a container to attach myself to a larger site, history, tradition, place, location, landscape, et cetera. Um, and in doing so, find out more about where that little inkling, feeling, sense thing comes from. Um, and also more about where this other thing, what it, what it was doing that might have affected that in me. And sometimes those distances can be sort of pretty short, like my children's bedroom. Other times they can be pretty deep, like Enclosure, which takes place in 16th century England, or in between, like I made a work that I shot at Philip Johnson's glass house. The sites can really be anywhere, um, and I never really know where I'm going to end up. Uh, but to answer your question about immortality, for me, they are the the reason to make the work is to create a little container for that feeling that I can return to if I ever want to feel that feeling again or know more about that feeling, and that for um, an audience we can go there together and experience that feeling always together. And I think it's the same in music and in film and in dance. It's it's a place that we can go and share a kind of specific combination of feelings connected to things outside of ourselves. Yeah, so this actually brings me to Jeffrey then, because the ultimate, this is an interesting concept, I hadn't thought about it before that way, that you're sort of virtualizing yourself and extending yourself through these objects. And the ultimate example is the world you work on, which is cities, sort of the virtualize the collective and actually threatening to destroy the world, right? And so, it's not us destroying art, it's actually our art as civilization destroying us. Do you just want to comment on that idea of the, this extended human and how, how profligate it is? Well, yeah, okay, let me, <laughs> let me first connect it to what's been said a little bit. Um, first of all, um, we brought up questions of the, um, the impact of human beings on the planet, We've even touched now on death, mortality. And uh, they're both things that I think about quite a lot, especially because I'm very close to being immortal, <laughs> very close to my own demise. And, uh, in, and in fact, getting closer and closer to it has made me return more and more to thinking about the sort of, um, I don't know, high school, sophomoric, even childlike, um, questions that originally got me into becoming a scientist and that is you know how does it all work uh, and what's the meaning of life and why are we all here and uh, I think about that quite a lot and what's the whole point of all of this sturm und drang that is what we, we are all participating in and we now have you know eight billion people on this planet who are participating in this. And um, so uh, it, one of the things that we have done, and it already alluded to in, by Manfred, in terms of what eventually led to cities, one of the great things we did, of course, one of the great transitions was the invention or discovery of language so that we can communicate with each other we can start, uh, we start to realize that by working together, we can accomplish more than by each of us working singly, kind of a great economy of scale, and so on and so forth. And that eventually led, of course, through 
agriculture, which is a static, more static phenomenon in space, uh, to sedentary life, that is communities and then cities and so on. And that now completely dominates the planet. This is a planet of cities. We, um, you know, I don't know, uh, 200 years ago, in those wonderful idyllic pictures that are here, um, everybody lived like that, in quotes. It may have been sort of a romantic image, but, uh, you know, only a 2 or 3% of the population was living like we live now in an urban situation. 95 to 98% lived in those beautiful idyllic situations. Of course, they're somewhat romanticized because it was, <laughs> life was tough for sure. But cities now are dominating the planet and by the time, uh, by the, towards the end of the century, there'll be 80% of the people probably be living in cities. And um, they have all arisen sort of some, I'm simplifying, but some fundamental level because of what we're doing now, the interaction and the extraordinary positive feedback that takes place in terms of uh, what we, in terms of our interactions, our social networks. And that has led, that positive feedback has led to all the marvelous things that we have from our iPhones to this building, to our automobiles, to the whole structure. And that's fantastic. But it has built into it, unfortunately, a continue, continuously accelerating pace of life. And we all recognize it. Uh, many of you look to be also close to more, ta more being <laughs> <laughs> like me. And you sure as hell know that 70 years ago, life was much slower, much slower. Uh, and uh, you didn't have to buy a new iPhone every couple of years and uh, learn new things and so forth uh, so quickly. In fact, uh, 70 years ago, most of us assumed everything was gonna be pretty much the same. That's certainly not true. So that has built into it something that's called a singularity, that it's one of these transitions. And we're heading exponentially fast, so to speak, towards that singularity. And uh, so it's kind of extraordinary, even just being reminded of those pictures and then seeing the juxtaposition of that with your good night moon, pictures of that transition, that uh, you didn't take it one step further to the potential transition to the next stage, which could be, sadly, collapse. And we need to come to terms with that. And that's what, of course, we're, that's the struggle, the struggle of global sustainability and what that means. And climate change, by the way, I just finished with this for this part. Climate change is just one manifestation. It happens to be one of the most obvious ones, but everything about life, because indeed it's wonderful that in the title that you give, complex self, complex connotes what's already, everything is interconnected and cannot be disentangled from anything else. So we can't just think of solving climate change or just the health problem or just energy or just transport. They're all interconnected. And COVID was a marvelous case of that where this bloody virus mutated in Wuhan and within three to four months, there was a shortage of flour. There was no football in Spain. Hertz went bankrupt all within a few months. Who would believe that flour was connected with the bankruptcy of Hertz? But it is, because it's a highly complex interactive system, and that's what we have to come to terms with. Okay. Sorry. No, sorry. I could see that the only time you got emotional with no football in Spain. <laughs> Nothing else really mattered. But it was... But, um, but let's just... You know, it's interesting. Over the years um, at SFI and uh, in science, I've seen this transition in how what people are concerned about. And, you know, when I first got to SFI 20 years ago, it was all about their careers and what area to work in. You know, scientific, what do I do to be successful as a scientist, which is a tedious conversation to have, incidentally. <laughs> um, but then there's the, nowadays, it's much more, how do I make a difference? And, um, 
and I and I again back to the writer there, Elvia and artist. I think we're all sort of committed to this, right? Doing really good work, aesthetic work, mathematical work, computational work, but also being aware that we're near a cataclysm, and there's no denying it, and several perhaps. Um, and you mentioned this, Rachel, yesterday, your concern. Is what I'm doing important? And, um, and I think it is, but I'm curious to know how you, both of you actually think about the role of the arts um, in both being profoundly moving aesthetically, but also being engaged. Well, I'll just, I'll answer that briefly, which is that um, I do psychoanalysis and a basic premise of any kind of uh, therapy is you have to know how you feel in order to change, basically. And I think that a very simple thing that art can offer in a time of such ca catastrophe is uh, a generous space to confront how we might feel. That's all. That was beautiful. Um, thank you. I'd also love to know what Ted thinks about this. Um, I don't think I've ever given a book talk where I wasn't asked at the end, um, how can we solve climate change? <laughs> Um, which I always think is shocking for a novelist to be asked, but I suppose it's because I write what could be called speculative fiction, what could be called environmental or cl you know climate fiction, um, and then I I also get asked you know um, yeah can I change the world with a book and I always say well no the book is not going to so or sometimes I say yes I've solved climate change with my novel like it's it's done now um, <laughs> but but one thing that I say is that. Artists and writers are not just artists and writers, we're also people, and we can have many roles in our lives. And I, I always want to emphasize, you know, I, I am a writer and I believe in the capacity of art of many kinds to help us understand what we feel, to imagine, to expand the range of what is imaginable, um, because often our um, imaginations become very narrow. Um, and one thing that fictions can offer, one thing that aesthetic encounters can offer, is simply to even just incrementally change the bandwidth of what is possibly imaginable, which is an incredibly powerful political move, I think. Um, but I also think we, we can just do other things in our lives, and that's, that's valuable um, outside of what might be considered our creative work. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's hard, it's hard talking to young students, especially. I find this increasingly challenging. Um, but I do think um, what, one other thing that comes up is if you're writing anything sort of future oriented. And I do think what's so moving to me about Rachel's work is that it is rooted in the beauty of the everyday, the meaning of the everyday, the minutia that becomes so maximal because that is how we encounter our world is through our primary aesthetic experiences. Um, but I do think that um, in terms of future oriented fiction, I, I'm always thinking about one, you know, one step ahead or maybe one step to the side. Um, but I'm not in the business of prediction. Um, that's something that I actually would trust all of you to do. No, much science more. is not in the business of prediction. Well, that's statistics. <laughs> that's machine learning. We're in the business of understanding. Who? So okay. So who can? <laughs> Tell us. us. I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe Ted can. I, I suppose I often say, well, you know, trend forecasters could or, you know, somebody who makes a business out of prediction. But I'm more interested in sort of a lateral look, just expanding that range of possibility. I, I, Ted, I, I did. I, let me just argue this because I, I really want to make this quite clear. Philistine science is in the business prediction and um, science is a part of the humanities. Let's be clear. It's a human endeavor. We're trying to understand our place in the universe, and you can do it as you do or we do, methodological difference. But this obsession with prediction has been a real problem, and it's why in science now, we're wrestling with machine learning and like, anyone, by the way, who wants to chime in on this, but I really want to be strong on it, we're, that we're in that business of trying to understand our role in the universe and on Earth. But Manfred, quickly, one second. Ted, did you want to uh, respond to Elvia's question there about the role of the writer and so forth? Well, um, sure, I can do that. Uh, so when it comes to talking about, uh, say, the, uh, the possible political role of, of science fiction, which is what I write, um, uh, I always uh, um, quote something that uh, Mark Fisher said, the uh, cultural critic, 
And he said, um, he was talking about emancipatory politics. He said, emancipatory politics must always destroy the appearance of a natural order. It must reveal what is presentable to be a mere contingency, just as make what was previously deemed to be impossible seem attainable. And, um, you know, when I encountered this quote, I was like, you know, that is exactly the job of science fiction. It is uh make you uh think that things that you've been told are impossible actually are not impossible and the things that you know uh, so you that everyone wants you to re regard as an as axiomatic as an unquestionable assumption the sort of the role of science fiction is to make you question those and you know uh you could you could say simply something similar about and uh and so the so there i think there the project of art in general is you know in alignment with the you know the project of you know the politics of a man uh they are going about it in you know in different ways but i think you know their goal it their goals are are very closely aligned yeah, I, I just quick comment. I remember reading Vaclav Havel's prison journals, and in those journals, he says that um, the belief in revolution um, is the precondition of social change. So it's not that you want the; it's exactly his point. Um, the, the counterfactual is required. But Manfred, did you and and Chris and and uh, yeah, oh, just jump in whenever. I want to sort of push back a little bit to, uh, to you, David, uh, to your sort of ivory tower mentality. Uh, of, it's very, you can't, it's a very uh, big tower. <laughs> I mean, I fully agree that as scientists and science is in the business of really understanding and that's sort of the beauty and the purity of it. But as Olivia said, you know, that she's a writer and she's also something else, namely a human being living in the world. And so are scientists. And so we know certain things. And so we also have a responsibility to contribute to uh, solutions, even though the, the very act of doing that is very uncomfortable because we have to act on la layers on uncertainty that we are generally trying to avoid. So the problem that we have right now, we know pretty s with some statistical accuracy what possible trajectories of this planet might be, not exactly. Uh, so the business of prediction of saying when will the world warm up to 1.5 degrees, is it on August 28, 2027? That's stupid. But we know approximately where we are going. And, but we, uh, our understanding is incomplete, yet we are asked to intervene, to offer solutions so that the trajectory might change. And that's a very difficult proposition. I think that's where we scientists meet with uh, writers and artists who have a creative way of imagining possible futures. And that's the kind of productive uh, interaction that that panel in a way represents or that SFI and SITE in, uh, try to accomplish here. But uh, we have to really... Uh, as Schrodinger once said in a different context, but it applies here too, you know, we have to be prepared to make fools out of ourselves because otherwise we can retreat in the ivory tower and be like Nero and watch the world burn. So that's not an option. I think Chris also, yeah. Yeah, so I think what you're saying about understanding is very interesting because I think the shift that's happened in science is from understanding of a world that was out there very basic question, you know, what's a diamond? What's the sun like? What is the sun made of? You know, it was very much questions from us trying to understand this external environment that we live in. And I think the shift has been that even on the front of understanding, most of the questions we're now interested in, the frontier, are all questions where we're in the loop. So economics, innovation, uh, global ecology as it relates to humans, cities, um, AI, all these things are where sort of human agency is suddenly in the loop of the system. 
And so, I, I mean, my perspective is out of that comes a sort of natural questions about responsibility and agency. And, and I think the two start to get a little bit more in, intertwined. I think you're right. The shift that we're seeing um, in science is about, you know, having impact, what's my responsibility, all of that. I think it comes from moving into questions where we're, we're part of the phenomena and our, you know, our decisions are part of the phenomena and it's not just understanding a diamond or, or that we go around the sun or, or you know, much more external questions to, to ourselves. Which is the essence of complexity. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. I just Jeffrey. want to add a little bit to that and, and, and on the one hand, completely agree with you about um, understanding being the very essence of what science is about and in fact what the humanities are about. But um, I do want to also push back that um, science does involve prediction, <laughs> clearly, and if, because understanding involves prediction. That is, in order to understand something, you need to make certain predictions about certain things, which, of course, part of the scientific method is then to either gather data or hopefully do an experiment that verifies it. So that's part of the cycle of understanding. And uh, the big leap is when you move into areas uh, that do involve the kinds of things that uh, Manfred and Chris just talked about, and that is uh, when you have to make predictions about the future of mankind, the future of the economy, um, the future of the climate, and so on. And uh, there, I think uh, one, uh, indeed, one should not abrogate responsibility, um, but one needs to, and this is a very difficult problem, is to get across this idea that the nature of the prediction is much more statistical. And therefore, um, you know, we may indeed occasionally and maybe often may quote fools of ourselves. Um, but, and so the pressure more and more in society um, because of the kinds of problems that science has turned itself towards, um, the, the pressure is indeed to get more and more involved and more and more um, uh, predictive in that sense, which couples us in to um, the political and social process. And I think one, so while I'm, much of the work I do is of that nature, but I think one of the great pitfalls and one of the great problems that we are already facing is the pressure that science becomes just that. And that, to use that phrase, the ivory tower image that we're really trying to do science for science's sake, really understand some of the deep fundamental questions of life, of the universe, the origins of the universe, the origins of this planet, uh, and so on. Um, what are the fundamental particles? How does everything interact? And so on. All these traditional, very deep questions of science get, are going to get pushed more and more to the side. And one of the things that we have learned in the, what is it, 400 years that science has been going, that's the, I mean, it's an incredibly short period of time we've been thinking about these things. One of the things that we have learned is that dealing with fundamental questions leads to this extraordinary society that we have today. And a terrible example of that, you can all go and watch Oppenheimer. That bomb didn't come just because out of Oppenheimer's head. In fact, it had almost nothing to do with Oppenheimer. It came from all that fundamental science that predated it. And uh, so it will be for the future of mankind on this planet. So it's a, it's a tough game. It's a tough, tough paradox. I think I could jump in from the, <laughs> the art corner one more time. Um, one thing that struck me when we're speaking about um, the planetary was um, what preoccupies me when um, reading and writing fiction, which is um, the scale jumps that it's able to make. Um, and this is something that's been talked a lot about recently in the context of fiction that deals explicitly with climate change. But I think we could talk about planetary systems of all kinds, um, which is um, the ability to move from the highly individualized personal subjective experience to the macro 
and back again. And to continually make that sort of connection to kind of question how we can feel or make contact with what is larger than the individual. Um, the theorist Wendy Chun said something wonderful that I um, think about all the time, which is that as humans, we can make contact with the weather every day, but we can't make daily contact with the climate. We need a mediating force to make contact or to interpret climate change. But the weather is not the same as the climate. So what does it take or how could we move from these minute experiences, you know, the day in the child's bedroom, um, the day outside, and understand how that implicates us in ginormous systems and also um, how we can further implicate ourselves, which is a political move. One, one comment. I, I really pick up on what you said about that daily thing. <laughs> That's how I interpreted your Rachel's good night moon. I mean, these are, I mean, probably the wrong word. These mundane things lying around the kid's room, you know, uh, and uh, which are there, you know, to entertain, to educate maybe in some sense. But they are manifestations of all of the problems we're talking about, actually. And, and I think you had that insight. And I, I really respect that. I really responded to that. Yeah, I like the fact that you had Godzilla, but not to scale. No, that was my husband's when he was a kid. It's from Japan. Yeah. It really upset me because when I was a child, I, I couldn't have toys that weren't to scale. So having a Godzilla that's smaller than a car is a sort of a problem for me. Wait, but that's the whole thing. That's the whole point about that the really toys. Is they're off, the scales are off. Yeah, yeah that's the whole point. Well, I, okay, I, I get it, I get it. But yeah. it made me feel very uncomfortable. So I'm going to shift slightly um, because I know Ted wants to... Ted, just so you know, you're breaking up a lot. So kind of short declarative sentence or something like that because if you we have to digest those insights and then it pauses and breaks but the but this is something interesting and it comes up you know I was looking at your movie Enclosure and I look at that it makes me very frightened actually because it's a world pre-scientific revolution and it's just a world full of superstition and magic and all the things I've run away from <laughs> and um, and I'm I'm curious just to ask you in the introduction, because Ted's thought about, a lot about that, the decline of magic and what magic is. Um, and how do you feel about that, that, those two worlds, the, the world of the uncanny and the eerie and versus the world we live in now, which fe feels at least, even though it's more destructive, more certain? That's for me. That's for you. That's for me. <laughs> uh, well, I have to say yesterday, Ted uh, gave such a beautiful monologue on magic and, and capitalism and where we are today in, in industrialization that I actually feel kind of like sheepish about what I thought before yesterday, basically, but I'll say it, but I think it's wrong now, but I'll say it anyway. Um, basically, uh, yeah, when I made Enclosure, I was looking at this moment in, in uh, social British history in which uh, previously common land was being privatized divided up, burned, and sold off. And that was linked to this new enlightened class of the bourgeois doctor, lawyer, who were getting country houses and also starting their own farms and their own early burgeoning roots of the agricultural revolution, which then turned into the industrial revolution. So my interest in this moment really comes um, from the lens of looking at how, where we are today. Uh, how do we live in such a privatized society where the one moment that this might have come from. Anyway, to get to the uncanny and magic, um, pre this privatization, people were living no electricity, darkness, cut off from one another, no real literary capacity, no one's reading, writing. Um, and so magic, or maybe un magic in the form of alchemy, um, magic in the form of animism uh, between forces and animals in the forest, people's anthropology pomorphic projections on nature around them was a pretty um, kind of structuring way of how people saw themselves in the landscape. And as the landscape shifted, I had thought before yesterday, I had thought about this idea that the magic just became subliminated into cash, into capitalism, and that we now use, um, like our iPhones, they're 
magical or uh, we want to change our hair color. So we take out our credit card and we buy some hair dye and now we have new hair and um, this kind of instantaneous uh, shortening or getting on an airplane. These are all like maybe what I thought of before yesterday, forms of magic. Now I don't think so. So I hand it over to Ted. All right, Ted. So with that, yeah. you've been set up now. It, this better be profound. Yeah. Um, so, okay, just to sort of recap what I was saying in our conversation yesterday. Um, so the way I see the, you know, sort of the, the difference between uh, magic and science is that uh, science basically views the universe as a giant mechanism that is entirely impersonal. Uh, magic is when the universe responds to you in a personal way. It's magic is evidence that the universe recognizes that you're a person. Um, and you know, before the Enlightenment, uh, this was sort of a, a baseline assumption that the universe was aware of you and you know, paid attention to what you did. Uh, after the Enlightenment, uh, you know, we started to think of the universe as a giant mechanism. And um, you know, uh, I guess during the you know the initial part of the Enlightenment, this was mostly of theoretical interest. But then during the Industrial Revolution, it gained a lot of practical importance because uh, now uh, you know there was there were such things as factories and assembly lines and um, high quality artifacts were no longer. Uh, they no longer required a craftsman who you know really was emotionally invested in the work. Nowadays, you can get you know you know iPhones are are amazing, but no one who worked on the assembly line in an iPhone factory was invested in its construction at all. And uh, so now we have you know um, we're constantly reminded of how impersonal the universe is and. Uh, uh, Capitalism is constantly reinforcing that. Uh, it is uh, uh, telling us that we are sort of cogs in the machine. And um, magic, uh, cer certainly, you know, the role of magic in, in I think, fantasy fiction is uh, it's a way of imagining that the universe uh, recognizes that you're not a cog in the machine, that there is something special about you. Um, as an individual, uh, so you know there there's a sense in which you know uh, the role of magic in fiction is to uh, sort of remind people that uh, they are not uh, sort of interchangeable parts; that they have value as individuals. Okay. So do you want to argue with that, Manfred? No, I'm sort of <laughs> trying to sort of bring things together here because I think what we are seeing here is that, yes, science started by sort of distancing us from uh, the outside world so that we could observe that world, that we could understand the world, that we could build up that edifice of theories, but science continues. And what we learned over the last several decades, particularly more in the, uh, in the life and social sciences, is that it's not just an abstract, cold, mechanistic mechanism that shapes the world, but rather that it's a generative, creative, interactive mechanism, uh, co-evolutionary processes. And if we go then what uh, Chris was saying before, what we also learn is that we have to expand our scientific understanding to incorporate the actions of us. Because right now on this planet, you don't have a natural process that is not directly affected by decisions that we as humans make. We are, re we are shaping evolutionary dynamics. We are creating new forms of life. Uh, we are now in the Anthropocene, uh, the largest force on this planet. We are interfering with geological processes even. So we have to learn to understand us as part of those processes. And in a way, this is a returning, not to a magical way of understanding where we didn't know, but to a way where we do know, but we are now no longer separate from the world that surrounds us, but part of it. 
um, Chris, and then whoever. Yeah, I sort of can't help but ask if, you know, if we get artificial intelligence that's sufficiently complex and takes a personal interest in us, will that feel like magic again? I'm wondering what Ted's thoughts are on that. I mean, will we, will the world seem magical again if there's other types of consciousnesses that have capacities we don't understand and for some reason take a personal interest? Will that, you know, almost like we, when you're a child, many of the things your parents do feel very magical because you don't understand them and it is a very personal interest. So do you think we're returning to that, Ted? Uh, well, um, yeah, I, I guess I don't, I don't think artificial intelligence is going to um, be conscious in the foreseeable future. Uh, I think a lot of people will try and sell us uh, the idea that, you know, that we're dealing with conscious beings, but, um, but it, it's just going to be a sales pitch. Uh, so, um, so yeah, in general, uh, uh, yeah, I don't think AI is going to uh, sort of increase the amount of consciousness in, uh, in the world. I think uh, as it is currently applied, AI is mostly going to increase the power of capitalism in our future. So, um, so actually, I kind of think that it's more, much more likely that AI will um, kind of reinforce our, our feelings of powerlessness and um, uh, reduce our, uh, what agency we have. Yeah, this is a very hot hot topic at SFI now, just the whole meaning of these new large language models. And um, and I think most of us believe that they are, at the moment, just um, advertising gimmicks for large tech companies. Um, but that's another rant. Um, <laughs> one, well, I want to talk about something slightly different, actually, that comes up in your work when I, you know, I think Chris Manfred and I were talking about looking at your work, Rachel, and... I'm not quite sure what to make of it when I first look at it. It's very, it operates unconsciously. And um, I'm not saying it operates magically, but, but it takes me a while, you know, and then it's like, okay, what's going on here? Um, and, I, and I say this to pivot to a, something I know that Jeffrey's interested in, which is a relationship, and, I, and by virtue of his marriage, actually, with Jacqueline here, who is a Jungian analyst, and... Um, this quite interesting relationship between the unconscious and conscious. Um, and I, would you talk a little bit about the relationship between Pauli and Jung? Yeah, you, yeah. And, um, I thought you were talking to Rachel. <laughs> well, I talked to anyone, but I, you, I'm, I'm looking at you. And, and that quite unlikely relationship, which I think gets to something quite deep about the creative imagination. Yeah, what, uh, what David is referring to, some of you may know, I mean, there's the, uh, you've certainly heard of uh, Carl Jung, the, uh, um, I guess, one-time protege of Jung, of uh, Freud, who then separated and formed a uh, different version, I guess, of uh, psycho psychoanalytic theory that was, um, in, in many ways, um, actually much more related to the, whatever we may think about, about the complex self um, and its relationship to the universe. And, uh, um, but during the, after he had separated, um, a man some of you may well have heard of, if you come out of any scientific kind of background, Wolfgang Pauli, who was truly one of the great physicists, maybe great scientists of the 20th century, um, and uh, was a remarkable man in himself, um, uh, sought out Jung uh, to um, because he was <laughs> maybe I should I can't get the quote exactly but he states that um, he was um, he'd had he had great success in the academic world and almost no success with women <laughs> and he sought out sought out Jung because Jung was exactly the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in the blanks, and um, and they formed this kind of collaboration, and between sort of the, the the world of physics, and the world of the psyche, so the, the kind of uh, this objective scientific world that we've been referring to, um, but it was already getting conflated because of quantum mechanics, and um, and so even though 
Pauli originally went to uh, to Jung in order to deal with his neuroses and uh, problems of his youth and so forth. Um, he they eventually moved out of that into a kind of collaborative relationship, and indeed. They even wrote scientific papers together, which is kind of amazing. And one of them was indeed whether quantum mechanics can explain both consciousness and sort of mystical experiences. And in particular, this idea that Jung had been playing with of synchronicity. That is that, you know, the, that uh, things happen that seem to be synchronous that have no relationship to one another and have somehow come together. So, um, it's interesting that um, as far as I know, maybe other people here know, there might have been other relationships like that that have been fruitful, at least in the discussion of um, you know, the, this whole um, uh, challenge between sort of the scientific methodology and trying to understand the world and the, the slightly mystical world of the psyche and consciousness and related to what um, uh, was just talked about in terms of magic. Um, I mean, it's sort of interesting, just on a personal level, I've been married to a Jungian analyst for about 175 years, <laughs> and um, we butt heads on these questions from time to time, but we've never actually tried to collaborate on something, although I think at least on one, maybe two occasions, we've given talks together. I mean, we've shared the platform together. But uh, it's never gone quite the way of Jung. One, one last thing about that Jung Pauli thing is that they did decide the one thing that, they, that brought it all together was this idea that Jung had developed called Unus Mundus, one world, meaning the idea of complexity. Everything is interconnected. And in modern parlance, in physics, that's grand unified theories. And then in its most absurd manifestation, the idea that many of you probably read about the theory of everything is kind of nonsensical. But that's sort of this conceptually, that idea that there is, a, there is underlying everything an extraordinary unity and interconnectivity. And, and I think that's what they passionately both focused on. How are we doing? I don't know. I haven't been watching. How, what's the timing thing here? 15 minutes. Okay, I might actually... One more point and then open it up. I know we weren't going to do this because I was thinking I expected people here to go on forever and ever. Well, one person did. But the... <laughs> no, we love each other. It's not an issue. The, um, but I think I will because... Um, I think it makes sense, actually, in, especially in this audience in Santa Fe, given the combined science and art interests. So if that's okay with all you, I, perhaps we should take some questions and ask, ask anything, anything you like. Yeah, there was a, the hand went up extremely quickly over there. <laughs> it was like you were swatching a fly. Astronomy and engineering, agriculture, uh, medicine, politics, these are all sciences, right? <laughs> Not the last one. <laughs> Not the last one, all right. Or is it you know, medicine? I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate your entertainment value. Um, I guess my question is, um, and throughout all of this, I haven't heard anyone uh, mention Native American sciences. And uh, I heard... I did hear someone say that science only came about 400 years ago, and I think that's egregiously wrong. I think that uh, if you look at 21st century archaeology, all the new tools that are being used to determine how far back all of these sciences go, if you look at the fact that 65% of the food that we eat was grown and developed first in the Americas before the Columbian Exchange, then you see the value that Native Americans have already given to the world. And, uh, and I would just wonder, my question is, are any of you planning on exploring that in any of your work? Seeing as we are in Santa Fe and we did do that land acknowledgement. 
I think you answered your own question better than we could. Um, but if anyone has something to add. Yeah, so I think, so we have many people in our community who do think a lot about um, the history of the Southwest, for example, and all the amazing archaeoastronomy that went on and what, you know, what the constraints were for early settlements and the large societies built here and so forth. So I think a lot of the, the sort of city principles that are thought about in our world um, are being greatly enriched by thinking about, by that, about that history um, and how many of the same principles are at play. So um, I agree with David. I think you answered your own question. I think there's a lot of agreement. Anyone else? So there's a question at the back. Hi. Um, earlier in your discussion, you were talking about composting humans and human cities, um, kind of ruining the planet. And we started the conversation out with death. And I wanted to ask you all um, to speak a little bit if you have thoughts on the impact of culture and colonialism and resource extraction and genocide on those conditions that are killing the planet, seeing as we have um, ample examples of people who are living very harmoniously with um, the natural world. Big question. Ray, I think that's for you, Rachel. <laughs> 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 does, does anyone would, would anyone like to take that question? Is it answerable? Well, I can oh, say okay. a few things. Uh, so I think you are absolutely right that uh, a lot of the dynamics that we encounter is a consequence of a particular form of human-to-human -human interaction, uh, which is not just a European phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. And you can go back in evolutionary history and ask yourself which of our two closest ancestral species we are most closely resembling. Uh, they are the bonobos who sort of resolve conflict by sex and then they are the chimps who behave like us uh, by basically killing each other off if they get an uh, opportunity to do so. So we are dealing here with, with strong evolutionary behavioral uh, constraints that are often mitigated by social and cultural constructs. Uh, so that's when you refer to societies that live more harmonious with their world. Those are societies who generally tend to be small and have a very elaborate and functioning, let's call it social regulatory system that's part of their culture. Uh, we are now a global society of 8 billion and we haven't figured out how to get along at that scale. And a lot of the problems that uh, we see are a direct consequence of a mismatch between our intrinsic ten tendencies and the cultural layer that would be required to rein us in. And uh, you can look at uh, human history sort of in a very abstract way along those lines as to how did we manage to create regulatory system that allow us to get along. Religion played an enormous role in that his history. And now that we have a society that is global, we have not developed the institutions necessary uh, to not sort of act on our base instincts rather than uh, on what is a proven potential of the human race. Um, but can I respond to that? Of course. Uh, so I guess uh, I, I tend to think of this in terms of what sort of strategies are successful over the short term versus what kind of strategies are successful over the long term. And um, so I think, you know, a lot of the strategies that were sort of developed in Europe uh, are have proven like extremely successful over say the 500 year time span. Um, but it seems likely that they are not going to work over say the 5,000 year time span. Uh, whereas, you know, I'd say, I think, you know, most indigenous cultures, they have adopted a strategy 
which uh, works well over, say, the 5,000 year time span. Um, but, you know, so, the, yeah, so right, like right now, I think our problem is that, um, uh, you know, the, the strategies devised, you know, sort of in Europe over the last, you know, 500 years, uh, those seem to work really like it's it's hard to compete against them. It's hard for, you know, uh, the strategies that indigenous cultures adopt to compete against, you know, these sort of European strategies over the short term. And, um, you know, yeah, I guess the challenge facing us is, you know, uh, can we, you know, sort of shift away from thinking about things in the, you know, the short term to think about what strategies will work for us over the long term, um, you know, what what kind of uh, what kind of strategies will allow us to survive for five thousand years, and um, can we stop focusing on you know like the next decade or the next you know uh, quarter, the not the next fiscal quarter, long enough to you know sort of shift into uh, a strategy that uh, is geared for a longer time scale. Well, I'll just add to that. Uh, is it on? Yeah. I'll just add to that. Yes, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I mean, one of the things that I sort of touched on it earlier, but, um, uh, you know, in, in, in up to very recently, um, most people lived in a relatively static, very slowly changing socioeconomic situation, whether, whether they were in um, small indigenous groups, um, or even in the kinds of uh, societies in medieval times. I mean, things really changed, hardly changed at all in a person's lifetime. And, um, and so regulations and laws and customs and so on were very appropriate to those kinds of timescales. And so one could stay much more um, in, in consonance not only with the fellow human, human beings, but with the environment. Now things are changing incredibly fast at an extraordinary rate. And yet, you know, in, in the, and if you look back over the 10,000 years in which we have participated in this extraordinary experiment that we are all participating in right now, um, if you look at that, the change has been enormous, obviously, from hunter-gatherer, to the kind of society we now live in, but we have the same body, the same biology, and most importantly, the same brain. This is pretty much the same as it was 10,000 or 100,000 years ago that had to deal with completely different set of problems, and most importantly, those problems were static, they were passed on from one to another, the same problems had to be dealt with and so on. And I would say, just a, just a side comment, one of the things that I think is so mysterious and so extraordinary is how we've adapted. I mean, how you have adapted in your lifetime to this change, um, let alone, you know, we as a, human, as, a, as a society. So that's kind of amazing. And the fear is that we've now reached the critical point where we're no longer able to adapt fast enough to the changes that are taking place. So whilst it would be wonderful to be able to sort of stop the clock and go back to being in that relatively static case, it's impossible. And that's what we just simply have to face that. And, uh, and going to what Ted said, um, you know, one of the things about this, the increasing pace of life is that every politician you know, two years is infinity. And the problems we have to face are, you know, we have to be thinking minimum of 10, 20, 100 years. So. Yeah, it's worth, is that what, yeah, making a sort of, a, again, to my earlier remark about what people, it's interesting, the two questions, here we are in an art museum, and we're mathematical scientists, but the questions that we're being asked are more and more like that. And I think it's sort of interesting, and here we are, we're not, it's not a political forum, it's not Davos, thank God, um, but it's but it is interesting, and I and I think it 
the responsibility on us and others um, who have felt somewhat removed from those types of issues, I think, historically. And now they're all converging in interesting ways. And the question is, how do you not become a political bullshit artist, right? And it's so much of it is, and it's just gesturing and posturing versus being rigorous in those domains. And, and I think that's, that, at least for, I think all of us up here, is the real issue, not just talking about it, um, but actually doing something of value. But um, it, there may be time for one more question. One if, more question uh, back here. Here we go. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Oh, no, it wasn't. That wasn't the person I looked at, <laughs> but perhaps. But no, since you're up, share. let's We can go. ask our question at the oh, same time question, if you want. Then, uh, no. yeah. This is an, an AI question, and it has to do with social cohesion, um, as well as the unconscious and, and rigor of thought. How are you individually um, protecting yourselves from the coming wave of disinformation and disruption that will be coming from AI integrating with the media more? And how do you think it will be affecting social cohesion more generally? So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a disaster. <laughs> it's a total disaster. Um, I don't know, Ted and I, we've talked about this a lot. I don't know, Ted, you probably have, Ted's written about this quite extensively, actually. Um, I don't know if there's a short, is there a reasonably short answer to that question, Ted, about the, the spamification of the universe? Uh, yeah, I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, but yeah, my primary concern about uh, you know, these recent uh, generative AI models is that um, we may permanently degrade the internet as a source of useful information. Um, I don't think it would, it, it, it will take very long uh, before, the inf before the internet ceases to become a source of, of reliable information if, uh, it be, if it's so easy to automate the production of misinformation. Um, and yeah, so I don't know what, uh, what, the, um, what the solution is. I, uh, yeah, like, as individuals, you know, we can do our best to be, you know, vigilant, but, but yeah, this is not a problem that, you know, ought to be solved by individual vigilance any more than, you know, climate change is a problem to be solved by, you know, uh, individual action. You know, this is some, this is a, a problem that requires, uh, you know, policy. Do we have a question about aesthetics? <laughs> not, no more no, 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 no more of those questions. <laughs> Is that, you, you stood up before? Do you want to ask your? Hi, um, I actually have a question for the, for Elvia, Rachel and uh, Ted. So, okay, so my question is, it's about art, but also about AI. Um, what do you think, uh, with the rise of AI art, and you know, I see so many artworks nowadays being AI generated. What do you think that AI poses an existential threat to artists and writers in the future? And what do you think? Um, I guess, like, what do you what do you think of that? What's your take on that? Okay, we'll start from the side. Um, that's something. It's funny. I thought about this a lot a couple years ago. And then when this um, most recent like explosion of discourse tied to uh, you know profit making um, developments um, happened, I was like, oh, well, didn't didn't we already have, like? I, it's sort of like we we keep having the explosion. We keep having the breaking point at which suddenly we are existentially threatened. Um, and I'm at this point refusing to be existentially threatened personally. <laughs> I just, I, I don't want to be. Um, but I would say um, one way of looking at it is that we are uh, expanding our tools. Um, one way of looking at it is that we are expanding the realm of non-human consciousness out there uh, to collaborate with. Um, and it's tough because if we're talking about um, uh, rote procedures, um, yes, they will be outsourced, um, certainly. Um, when it comes to making art, assuming that there is something intrinsically human about it, I don't know if that will change. But my argument when talking
talking about, for instance, there's a novelist who, whose work I'm very interested in who writes novels in collaboration with AI. Collaboration, what does that mean? Can you collaborate with somebody who's not human? Um, and I think yes. Um, and I think that um, attributing authorship is an important part of that. But what I think is really useful when we look at artists collaborating laterally with machines is that it allows us to question the notion of human genius that we are, we've inherited in the first place. So the idea that a singular human operates in a vacuum comes up with genius ideas um, all by themselves when almost every artist you could say has always been influenced by the world. Many people have worked in workshops, right? Like most of our famous painters um, had help. <laughs> so, um, so I like the way that the, this discourse um, could be used to actually destabilize the way we think of artistic production throughout time and maybe question the human, um, yeah, the role of the human genius at the top of the pyramid. Um, and it actually presents some really interesting challenges to um, the way we think about labor within the art world, which, um, which is a complicated question. Um, but I don't yet know how I feel about, I work with AI sometimes, I ask it questions. I like to know what it says, <laughs> but I don't feel usurped by it because I'm also making art for me and my community. Um, and it will stay that way. You know, uh, Isaac Newton said uh, this famous one, many of you know, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants going, to the, uh, namely, you know, I've needed all this other stuff. And I guess what, what it is, is those giants now will include ChatGBT. That's all. <laughs> It already includes the internet. <laughs> uh, Rachel, did you want to say something on this? Well, I mean, I actually, I think Elvia just uh, summarized and said it so coherently, but I will just make an aside that incidentally, my husband has worked with AI in his work for, I don't know, like a long time, 12 years or something. And when he started his work, his, his career 12 years ago, it was sort of, odd what he was doing and now it's pretty normal so i'll just say that i've made my work alongside someone working with ai for a long time and it seems fine to me it doesn't seem like it's controlling his brain or anything yeah. <laughs> um okay so uh you know th this is a really you know big conversation and so you know we can't really fully address it here but i'll i guess uh in brief um I mostly think that um, this is most uh, important uh, when we think about like the sort of the intersection between uh, art and commerce or sort of the the um, the economics of art and um, how you know, how much do say you know uh, to what extent is is any particular field of art affected by you know sort of the market? Um, because, you know, art covers a lot of different things and, you know, there's some endeavors of some regions of art, which, you know, are not really governed by the market. And there are other types of art, which are very much dominated by, you know, some conventional sort of market economics. And, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the impact of a AI, I think varies depending on like how much market economics plays a role in the in you know that specific field um because like you know there is uh um you know there uh, a lot of most of the art that is displayed in art galleries you know uh you know that's working under a certain economic model which is very different than say fiction which is in turn very different than uh pop music which is in turn different than um commercial illustration and uh the uh so yeah the the impact of art uh, of the impact of ai is is highly dependent on sort of what economic model is at work in this in the sphere that you're talking about um so uh I don't think it's going to be an existential threat to art in general, but it does pose, you know, it, it will sort of force, you know, some economic, you know, uh, changes because it'll exert, you know, these sort of market pressures 
on certain uh, sectors where, uh, where yeah, market pressures are, are operate in a certain way. Just quickly, final, because I just want to again say, we are here to see your work, Rachel. And um, even though you, we're collective and collaborative individuals matter, and um, the individual view matters, and the, and the uniqueness of your history matters. And so despite um, this recognition uh, of the contribution that culture has made, I still believe very firmly um, in the power of the individual mind. And so thank you for your work, Rachel.